Are there any good investments in the material sector? It's one of the 11 gig sectors. Let's watch this video and find out. Hello everybody, this is Chuck Carnivale, co-founder of FastGraphs, the Fundamentals Analyzer software tool, aka Mr. Valuation. You know, this is part nine of my 11 part series where I cover each of the sectors. And I want to first, before I go any further, I want to wish everybody a happy and all these in, the investors that are you know subscribers to the channel a happy and most importantly a profitable and prosperous 2024. Let's look at the material sector, and let me start by showing you how I screened through this sector. I want to talk about screening a little bit here because I think a lot of people have misunderstood what I've been trying to accomplish. One of the main things I was trying to do with this series of articles is show everybody just how different stocks can be in the various sectors and how it truly is a market of stocks and not a stock market. So rather than thinking about, you know, generally, we should always be thinking about the investments that we choose. And like I like to say, mind your own businesses. But another thing about screening, there's so many ways you can screen, especially with the Fast Graphs powerful screening tool. But I tried to do really simple screens here. So under the general section, I want you to note I had six items that I screened for. I screened, of course, for the material sector. I wanted to see primary stocks. I wanted to see a positive dividend yield, the earnings yield of 6% or higher, and that would indicate a P.E. ratio around 15. And then I wanted a moderate persistency score of above 60%. Now, this is where a lot of the material companies would have actually failed. Under the historic section, I screened for five-year positive earnings growth. Under the estimated section, I screened for total return greater than 5% and positive future estimated EPS growth. And then I limited my search to the U.S. and Canada. Now, I want to show you this because there are numerous other ways that you can work these screeners. You know, I want you to note that I had so many other choices. And when you're working with a screener, you can just keep, you know, filtering things until you get the actual results that you're looking for. But then what I did was I created the materials total return, and then I went and I converted it into a portfolio. When you use our screener in Fast Graphs, you just click the Add to Portfolio down here in the bottom right-hand corner, and that goes ahead and you know, allows you to create a portfolio. But I've already done that. So let's go right into the portfolio section of Fast Graphs. I you know, find it here in my navigation bar. I go to my portfolios. I'm going to continue without saving because I haven't saved anything. I'm going to go to the when I created and double click it twice. And you'll see the materials total return portfolio was created on January 2nd, 2024. Okay, so let's go ahead into that portfolio. Now, I ended up with 12 names in the material sector that I'm going to be covering in this video. Okay, and then I went in and I created a view just to give you some insights into these companies. Now, the first thing I'm looking at here is what does the you know portfolio really offer me in terms of you know, metrics that I was looking for in my screener. Well, first of all, you'll see here, if I go to the earnings yield column, they all had an earnings yield over 6%. That was one of the major criteria. So if you're looking for companies in material sectors that are not covered, probably because they didn't have an earnings yield of 6%, that's getting close to a 15 PE. Now, I want you to notice the two without a 65 to 7%, 6.67% or higher, were only these last three. And that was a PE of crown of 15 0.21. CCL Industries had a PE of 16.22, and FMC had a PE of 16.3. So they gave us earnings yields above 6%, but below my 6.67% minimum criteria that I like to look for. In other words, if I'm going to invest in a stock, I want all the company's earnings to represent at least a yield that's something compatible of 65 or 7%. But if I can get a higher yield than that, if I can get a higher earnings yield like 75 or 8 or 9 or 11, then I obviously like that a whole lot better. Now, another thing I want you to notice about this sector before I get into it is that the dividend yields here range from zero on Ingevity Corporation, a half a percent on Eagle Materials, and then up to 8.71% on Westlake Chemical, which is actually a limited partnership. And this does come with a K-1. So 
that's something that you know you want to take into consideration. So dividend yields here, I, I usually do these income and total return. So I've got four here on income, which I, I define as over 3% yield. And then the rest of them are kind of market neutral. Sealed there is a little bit above market, but it's, you know, it's close. Now, credit ratings is another issue. I want you to notice that there are only five companies out of these 12 that actually had an investment grade credit rating. The material sector is not really known for very highly profitable, you know, extremely high quality companies, but Sunoco, Eagle, CCL Industries, Cabot and FMC are actually, you know, pretty decent companies. They all have investment grade credit ratings. All right, but we'll go through these, you know, one at a time. Now, I'm going to do these in alphabetical order because that's the easiest way for me to go through this, you know, for you and, and basically um, give you a free-flowing video. So let's start with Barry Global Company and let's look at the company. Now, the FastGraph Fundamental Analyzer Software Tool, FAST, is a tool to think with. I say this many, many times. I want people to understand that you have to analyze with this tool. Okay, you use it to analyze things. So when I'm looking at Barry Global, I end up seeing a 38.5% earnings growth rate, you know, going back to 2012, which is the maximum time that we have data on the stock. And it was trading at 132 PE back then. It was very expensive. But it had 940% growth from you know, the previous year. Well, this is an anomalous number. I want to make that clear. So I'm going to go ahead and just, you know, go to 13 years and exclude that number because I'm analyzing this and saying I'm not going to let, you know, a 930% earnings growth rate in one year is simply not practical. Okay, so I eliminate it. Now I've got earnings growth rates. I want you to note 26%, 32, 46, 21, 10. Then I had a real flat year where we only had 1% growth. And this company has a September fiscal year. So that was September of 2019. Coming into COVID, they actually did very, very well, by the way. Their earnings grew by 42%. You can see that surge. And this is the COVID pandemic period here. Then it was 20%, 28 and then 0, 3, 12, and 12. Now, the fact that earnings growth varies significantly is something that you should always be taking into consideration. Now, since the growth rate was 18.67%. And since that growth rate is above 15%, fast graphs automatically goes to the Peter Lynch formula, PE equals growth rate. And some people call this a peg ratio of one. Okay, so this orange line is a PE of 18.67 on this graph over this time frame. If I shorten that graph to 10 years, I want you to notice now that the growth rate is only 14%, still very high, but only 14%. And now the Graham Dodd, that the dot, dot PE equals growth rate or extrapolated formula between the Graham Dodd formula for slow growing companies and the P equals growth rate for very fast growing companies. That's companies growing between 5% to 15% uses this formula. And that implies a 15 PE ratio as a valuation reference. Now, again, this is an analytical tool. What evaluation reference mean is I'm looking at this graph. I know that that's a 15 PE, and I do see that the stock traded really, you know, right around that 15 PE for 2019 fiscal years, 2018 and 19. And 2017, it actually traded at, you know, typically at a higher PE ratio than 15. Then we came into the COVID and we had the drop in price. And since then, it's been trading at a lower PE. And so for this time frame, the average market value PE ratio was 12. But again, that creates a valuation reference line. It's not a fact. It's a line that you analyze with. So now I look at this graph and I see the first three years here or so, I see the PE was above 12. Then for another couple of years, it was below 12 a lot. But it was also, you know, hovering around 12 quite often. And then since December of 2021, it's been trading at a much lower PE. So if I draw this as a four-year graph, for example, and include estimates, now the average market value multiple has only been seven. So if I go to a seven-year graph that includes the estimate data, I get about a 9.6 valuation. Now, what do I do with these lines? I look at this line and I say, okay, this is 9.6 times earnings. You know, if I'm buying Barry Global in the more recent time frame, I really don't want to pay more than around 10 times earnings for it. 
The current PE is 9, 9.03 blended PE. That gives us a very high earnings yield of 11%. But now I've got to focus on forecasting. So I go into my navigation bar and I go into the forecasting calculator and I see that 12 analysts expect this company to grow at about 9.65%. Now I'm going to analyze this section a little bit too before I make a decision. If that's a 9.6 PE, and if I go to the normal multiple for the last five years, it's been around 10, as I kind of alluded to. So 10 is a fair value multiple. This would indicate that the stock is slightly undervalued and it's expected to grow at 9.65%, pay a very modest dividend of about 1.6. So I would expect to make double digit returns. If this stock did trade at a 10 multiple and it did meet these earnings achievements, and I just point to this triangle, I could make 15.38% per annum. If we go into the 15 multiple that a 9% growth rate would theoretically indicate, your upside could be like a 32% annualized rate of return. So the company looks very attractive from a valuation point of view. But I also want you to note by analyzing this estimate you know, calculator here that analysts, you know, estimates have been dropping on this company in recent times. In 2023, it dropped, you know, to the 7.29, but then it came in at 7.42. For this year, which again ends in September, it started out, analysts six months ago were expecting $8.30. Then they dropped it to 802, and then they dropped it to 761 which is where the current estimate sits. And again, this is for September, fiscal year ending September of 2024. And likewise, they were expecting more earnings growth six months ago, a higher earnings number than they are now. But they are expecting a 12% growth over a 2.5% growth expected for this fiscal year that we're in. We're actually in 2024's fiscal year. You know, we only got three quarters left technically. And the bottom line is, you know, estimates are around 761. And right now, till now, they're holding, but that's only a 2.5% growth rate. But then for 2025, even though the estimates have fallen from 915, 870 to 855, which is where they're sitting currently, that would be a 12% growth rate and a 12% growth rate going forward. The long term growth expectation is for 15% growth. So analysts are expecting, and there's only two analysts giving us a long-term forecast, analysts are expecting after this year, future years to be very attractive, you know, in terms of growth rates. Now, when I look at the analyst scorecard, which is very important, I discover that on a one-year forecast with a 10% margin of error, I want to emphasize that, analysts have been really pretty accurate. They've only missed estimates 10% of the time. They beat estimates 60% of the time and hit them another 30. On the two-year, with a 20% margin of error, because it's further out, they actually beat estimates a third of the time and met estimates within that margin of error two-thirds of the time. So the estimate data here might be reasonably accurate. Now, you know, another thing that I wanted to point out when I go back into the portfolios here that I didn't mention is that the sub-industry is also interesting. Material sectors is things like metal and glass and plastic containers, paper and plastic packaging, chemicals, paper and materials, again, specialty chemicals, diversified chemicals, metal, glass, and plastic containers, commodity chemicals, construction materials with under eagle materials, metal, glass, and plastic, fertilizer, and agricultural products with FMC. So I want you to note that, you know, this sector does have a pretty diverse subsector, but they're all in materials, things that aren't highly profitable, at least from a historical point of view. Now, going into that, if I look at, you know, the maximum graph of Berry Global, it's been a pretty consistent grower, different rates, some cyclicality in the growth rate, but it's been pretty much an upward mobility. Now, that's not necessarily common for this sector. So let's go to the next one. Let's go to Cabot Corporation. This is commodity chemicals. Now, remember, as a FastGraph subscriber, you can just go to the external links and go right into the company's website, and it will, you know, give you all of the information about what the business does. You know, they've got adhesive and sealants. They're, they're heavily involved with, you know, batteries. They create materials that improve battery life, consumer rubber products, coatings, paints, and so on, construction, and so on. So you can learn a little bit about the company and spend a lot of time on their website. But let's look at the characteristics now of this company compared to Berry Global. First of all, we got 6.77% growth. 
that would indicate a P.E. of 15. The market normal P.E. has been 14.9. That's obviously the same as 15. Keep in mind, these are you know valuation reference lines. Now, as I look at this stock, I see that it's got a lot of cyclicality. Going through the Great Recession, for example, they had you know, two significant years of very dramatic drops in earnings. And of course, the stock looked, you know, trading at a 23 multiple in June of 07. You know, we saw this precipitous drop in value here. You know, it was almost an 80% drop from sort of peak to trough during the Great Recession. But then it recovered very dramatically. The next couple of years coming out of that, we saw a, you know, 450% growth as the earnings recovered by over a thousand percent, they went from sixteen cents to three dollars and four cents. All right, so you know, and then we had kind of flat earnings growth. And notice that the stock price kind of tracked that flatly. Then COVID came in. We had another precipitous drop in earnings, and of course the price dropped. And the price has been recovering, but during fiscal year twenty twenty three, and again we have a September fiscal year here we saw rather you know some pretty strong weakness in the stock price for most of the year but then going into you know expectations for faster growth going forward this stock does offer a 1.9% dividend yield it does offer a 6.8% and it's trading at under a 15 pe it is an investment grade company it's triple b rated with 44% debt and you know from a standpoint of forecasting analysts are expecting double digit growth in this case, we see the same pattern, you know, earnings growth expectations have been, you know, tempered, but they did start to recover from three months ago to six months ago. And now, you know, for 2025, they're expecting 742. And we see the same situation or a similar situation in 2024, where we're expecting about a 22% growth rate, followed by 12, followed by 10. The long-term growth rate of this company is not given, okay? So... You know, we're dealing with a rather cyclical company here. And when you look at the long-term historical picture, you can really see that cyclicality. It's hard to make a case to buy and hold a stock like this. It does have a very good dividend record, but it does go through periods of time where it freezes the dividend for years on years at a time. And it's, you know, frozen the dividend numerous times. Now, based on near-term forecasts, it looked like it could be an attractive buy today. But once again, it's very difficult to make a case for long-term investing in these stocks. Chemors, which is obviously diversified chemicals, is a very, very cyclical company. And I want you to note by looking at the fast graphs here, the first thing that strikes me, and I'm going to assume because of all this cyclical growth here, even though it's averaged 18.5%, if I change the time frame, it's 19%. If I change it again, it's only 3%. And that's what cyclicality does to you. It can really change the dynamic. As a result, we've only seen about a nine multiple on this company. And, you know, you don't want to buy really anything above nine. And right now, you could argue on that basis that it's slightly overvalued, even though it does have a decent earnings yield. And it does offer a 3.17% dividend yield, but they've, you know, kept the dividend flat now for several years. So that's, there's, so you're not really looking at dividend growth, but you are looking at current yield. From a forecasting point of view, we are expecting good years ahead for the next couple of years. Long term, once again, there's no long term growth being given. And again, with when we look at, you know, the analyst scorecard on this company, it does have periods where it's beat estimates and, and net estimates quite a bit. But it also has, you know, a pretty strong record, 33% miss and a 29% miss on one and two years. So, you know, very, very difficult to make a long-term investment decision here. And I want you to notice back here when we had really high growth and good price performance, once that momentum slowed down, you would have, you know, seen a period of time where you'd have had negative returns, including dividends, for the next five or six years. Very, very difficult to invest in these materials companies for that reason. Now, Crown Holdings is one of the true growth stocks. This is a very interesting stock. I've talked about this one before. They had a great record like this. If I take price off the graph and I shorten the time frame, you know, the company had a very consistent 12% growth rate. And if I even use the scrolling feature here and come back a little bit and, you know, get rid of some of these cyclical time frames here, you know, it had a 16% very consistent growth rate from the beginning of 05 through 1221. But the point is that, you know, the company at that point did not pay a dividend. It was strictly a growth stock. 
Now, this stock was coming out of bankruptcy, interestingly enough. This is the one Crown Court made an acquisition that had an asbestos division. They sold it within 90 days, within the first quarter that they actually owned this acquisition. And then when all the asbestos lawsuits came, Crown Court was one of the last men standing, and they literally got decimated by legal action. That's something to you know be concerned about with these chemical companies. And, you know, in this case, metal, glass, and plastic containers. Everything from lipstick tubes to bottles and aluminum cans, et cetera, et cetera. But the company does have a good record going forward here. You know, it had a couple of down years in 22 and 23, but is expecting double-digit growth and the initiating a dividend, but only expecting about a 1% yield. The stock is trading just barely above 15 times earnings. I would call it fully valued, and it you know offers a double-digit rate of return based on the fact that we expect double-digit growth, and long-term growth is still double-digit at 10.5%. So this is double B-plus company. It does have a lot of debt. If you look at the price action in this stock, you can see that the price has really tracked earnings on this company very, very closely. It did, you know, have a big drop. It was overvalued, got undervalued as a result of some bad earnings year. But then people start looking ahead and we started to see some recovery. We did see the initiation of a dividend and that probably helped, you know, some in the positive, you know, response that we've had since it, you know, bottomed out in 2022. And anyway, that's Crown Cork and Seal or CCK as it's now called. CCL Industries is an interesting company, metal, glass, and plastic containers as well. And again, I want you to notice how much insight FastGraphs gives you as an investor. You can see almost no growth during this period of time back here where the stock really languished. Let me use my scroll feature and get back here. So we had about 5% growth, and the stock you know, traded between around 12 and 15 times earnings. Then as time moved on, earnings began to accelerate, and you can see the response that the stock price gave to that. But then what happened after that, at that point, once this acceleration happened, then earnings began to slow down a little. This got the market all excited. These are lessons in valuation, if you will. The stock was trading as high as a 27 multiple here from their peak. And what I want to point out is that during this whole time here, I won't go to the very top here. I'm going to you know, try to go somewhere in the middle. And you know, from here to here, we end up with a 1% rate of return, including dividend income, because valuation was high and earnings growth slowed down. This is one of those stocks that's trading at a premium you know, to the 15 PE, even though it has some good historical growth. Future growth is only expected to be about 5%. I don't consider this all that attractive. Again, no long-term growth rate. It's very hard for the analysts to give these chemical companies a good growth rate. It only does have 34% debt. I might point out we're looking at Canadian dollars here. This is a Canadian company. We can go in here and switch, by the way, to other currencies. So we can, we can use the settings bar here and convert this to the U.S. dollar. And that will change, you know, what the company looks like a little bit, but not very, very much. This, is, this gets rid of currency exchange. The stock does have a pretty good dividend record, a, a pretty good record of growing the dividend. If you look at long-term performance, it's actually dramatically outperformed the market on both income and so on. But again, most of that performance was happening back during these years here when the stock really grew. More recent years, if I run this now as a say an eight year graph, okay, and look at performance, it's dramatically underperformed the market, you know, in both dividend income and growth, you know. And you got to remember, performance is always going to be a function of the growth of the business, the valuation you pay to buy that growth, and then any dividend income if it gives any. And you know, it depends, timing is everything, as they say, but it's not market timing. It's making sure you buy companies when they make economic sense. Next stock we're going to look at here is Eagle Materials. Now, Eagle Materials, you can see, went through a pretty bad spot here where earnings were dropping for four or five years in a row. And, you know, the stock did virtually nothing during that period of time. But then if we shorten this graph, you know, we've had really spectacular growth. But again, we've got an anomalous number here. So I want to pull that number out to kind of get a truer picture of around a 20% grower. And you can see the stock price is traded. Now, the P.E. on this orange line is 20. Um, the blue line is 20.54. The orange line is 20.86, which is the growth rate over that time frame. But as I shorten the time frame, 
Now the PEs are 16 and 17, or we'll call it 17. So the growth rate has changed. From a forecasting point of view, we are expecting double-digit growth going forward. Again, there's no long-term growth. You know, if I look at the forecasting calculators, the analyst scorecard is a bit iffy here. They've missed 40% of the time on a one-year, 33% or a third of the time on a two-year. But this company's growth rate seems to have stabilized, and the stock has been recovering very strongly with some good growth here in recent years. But once again, when I look at the forecasting calculator, the growth rate drops down to expectations from the 17% historical to 11. And if I look at, you know, historical compound annual growth here, the last five years, it's been 21%, you know, and I can see all these different growth rates. Again, I want to emphasize the analytical capabilities of this tool. It allows you to analyze things, but you must analyze. Picture tells you a lot. And the fast graph tells you a lot about the company. FMC one of the investment-grade companies only has 41% debt, has a 3.68% dividend yield. But here's a classic case of how earnings determine market price. You can see the price you know, followed earnings. When the earnings dipped, the price dipped. When the earnings rallied, the price rallied. And then when it continued to rally, it rallied with a lot of volatility. I want you to notice the volatile nature of these stocks. These stocks are probably better for trading than they are for long-term buy and hold. Then once earnings collapsed in 2023, they fell 48%. And at least they're expected to. This is still an estimate, but I think those numbers are going to be pretty good. And the stock price, you know, collapsed dramatically. Looking at it from the future, you know, we are expecting a return to double-digit growth. And the long-term growth rate here is expected to average about 8%. So I can go into the custom calculator, by the way, and combine the two estimates and, you know, we see that we get a pretty good double-digit rate of return potential with a very nice dividend yield with a high-quality company with moderate debt. But if you're going to invest in this stock, you've got to be willing to face the potential cyclicality that may happen in the company's operating results. Now, the payout ratio, I want you to note, has also increased dramatically. They were paying, you know, I'll call it mid double digit Now they're starting to pay out in the 25 or to 30% range of earnings. Of course, the payout ratio got high here because the earnings fell and the company maintained, actually raised its dividend or expected to raise their dividend. The stock looks inexpensive, but again, it's very, very difficult to be a long-term buy and hold investor. Ingevity Corporation, Specialty Chemicals, you know, the stock was trading at very high valuations when they had some real nice numbers. Then, you know, COVID came, the stock collapsed. And again, this is a big collapse. This volatility is something I want you to focus on as I go through this sector. It's very, very difficult to invest in these companies. And this has not been a good long-term play. Forecasting is expected some pretty decent growth going forward for the next couple of years. But long-term, we actually expect negative growth. So this is what I'd probably avoid, even though technically it has a good earnings yield but it has also no dividend yield to help you. The next one is Sealed Air. Sealed Air is a, a paper and plastic packaging company. It was just rated as one of the best. Crown Cork and Seal was included in that with Sealed Air. Again, I want you to see the cyclical nature. You know, we had a bad earnings year. The stock price, you know, collapsed. This, these big collapses in stock price are something that comes with investing in the material sector. But again, if you can buy them when they're cheap, then you can also, you know, for a period of years, make some really excellent rate of returns. Here from June of 2012 to August of 2015, we have averaged over 51% a year annualized. But then once that peaked out for the next four or five years, you know, you'd have lost 10% a year roughly annualized. But then if you'd have bought it, you know, somewhere in this area here when it was when it was real cheap, and I don't want to hit the very bottom, then you could have had a period where you could have made almost 50% a year annualized for a couple of years. But then again, that was followed by a big collapse. I just want you to get the notion of how cyclical these companies can be. Silgan Holdings is one of the other very similar to Crown Cork and Seal. It does have a longer dividend record. It is inexpensive. It's got a pretty good growth history. It's expected to grow about eight and a half percent going forward. Long-term growth is expected to be 10 percent. This does have a good long-term record. I do like it from that standpoint. So from a forecasting point of view, you know, you could see double-digit rates of return with a little bit of help from the dividend. And if you look at the normal multiple, only 13 times earnings, you would still 
expect to make 8%. But I do want to point out that looking at this stock, you know, the 8% is kind of an anomaly. It's normally been a 15 multiple company. Sunoco Products, again, is kind of a, a slower growing company. It's got very undervalued here in, you know, because of the downtrend in earnings in 2023. Going to the future, it's expected only grow at around 3.5% long-term growth only at 4%. So I don't consider this one especially attractive other than the dividend yield of 3.6%. It is investment grade, triple B rated. And, you know, it could be attractive from that standpoint. Then last but not least is Westlake Chemical. I'm glad it was a W because I did want to cover this one last. This is a limited partnership. It's primarily a high yield investment. You can see 8.7% dividend yield. Operating cash flow has generally covered the dividend. Free cash flow has also generally covered the dividend. But again, this comes with a K-1, and you know that causes some people some problems, but this has been primarily a income vehicle. Now, I'm going to get this down to where it was tracking earnings you know, so we can look at performance here from a good valuation point of view. It underperformed the market dramatically on a capital, actually, depreciation basis. But again, it almost tripled the dividend of the market. So this would be the type of stock you would put in and mix in with the portfolio if you're looking for income. Anyway, this has been Chuck Carnival, co-founder of FastGraphs, the Fundamentals Analyzer software tool. I'm looking at part nine of my 11-part series on the materials sector. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, give me a like, ring the bell, and of course, subscribe to the channel, but also take a look at subscribing to Fast Grouse. Gives you so much insight into the type of stocks that you could be considering investing in beyond any other tool that I know of. And I, you know, of course I invented it, but that's why I invented it. So I could get some greater insights into the stocks. Thanks for watching again. Happy New Year and a prosperous New Year to all. Talk to you with part 10 coming up soon.